Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I think we do have a collective pro problem, and we have many. We have a process of globalization that sometimes seems to be going too fast. We have one, t one or two billion people, possibly more, who are trapped in poverty, living in conditions where governments just don't work and a seemingly unbridgeable gap between rich and poor, both within the countries and between those countries and our countries. But I think we also have a huge opportunity. And that opportunity manifested itself because when the people of the Middle East started marching over the last months, they weren't mar marching against globalization. They weren't, weren't marching against the West. They were marching because they wanted political inclusion and they wanted economic opportunity. And I think there's still everything to play for. In, in making a, a world where globalization works, where the market works, where democracy works for everybody. I'd like to discuss three propositions today. First, talk a little bit about the nature of the challenge and why our traditional aid approaches just aren't working. Second, to look back to the recent past at why a number of countries have transformed and what we can learn from them. And then third, going forward, how can pre-emerging markets become emerging markets? And in doing so, why it's a great business opportunity for us and address the opportunity gap in the countries themselves. Um, I've put up here a map. It comes from Foreign Policy magazine. And every year, they come out with a list of the so-called failed states or fragile states. And there are somewhere between 40 and 60 of them. It's gone up recently. Maybe there are 100, maybe more. Would we include Greece on the list? <laughs> Um, some people are saying states within the US could be included on the list because they ex exhibit fragility, their budgets aren't balanced, um, they're running out of money, they've made obligations they can't meet. So maybe we're looking at something that's a universal problem and not just confined to countries. But today I'm talking specifically about the 40 to 60 um, of the so-called fragile states. Um, this is actually a picture from Afghanistan in, in 2001. I had the um, huge privilege and opportunity and responsibility to serve on the, the Bonn Agreement, the, the, which was meant to be a peace agreement just after the tragedy of 9-11. And a group of us stood in the rubble, something like this, and thought, where do we begin? And the list was seemingly en endless. What about civil society, education, health, markets, property? The, we needed to change the currency. How was the country going to earn revenue, um, set up a payroll system, police, army, rule of law, security? The list was seemingly endless. Um, but the good news was that while a lot of the external actors said there's nothing there, as soon as we started to look, of course there was a lot there. There was actually a very functional system. There were 240,000 civil servants and one of the oldest trading societies. The Persians had invented the check. Um, so there was tremendous assets, tremendous opportunity within the society. Um, but what we found was that the entities... Um, that were supposed to help often got it very badly wrong. And Dr. Ghani and I call this in our book, The Aid Complex. Now, there are many, many good people doing a great job making huge sacrifices. But, so it's not a question of individual failure, but it's as a system. We think the system is, is letting us down. So what happens? The UN agencies launch this enormous appeal, and suddenly there are 20,000 projects. And then suddenly they, they recruit away hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of doctors and teachers suddenly become drivers, assistants, and translators. There are multiple layers of contracting. There's wage disparities, double standards. And then suddenly you've got a coordination problem because you've launched so many thousands of, of projects. And everybody says there's nothing there, and it has to be brought in from the outside. And in the end, one asks who won the Cold War because it's looking to be quite a Soviet, very bureaucratic system, and it's delivering far less than, this, than the sum of its parts. And it ends up causing a lot of disaffection from the um, local population because the results fall very far short of the promises and ends up marginalizing the very citizens um, that, it's, that it's trying to help. And we've seen this not only in Afghanistan, but we've seen this in South Sudan and Haiti, um, the US Academy of Public Administration did a study of, of Haiti, which was called Why Foreign Aid to Haiti Failed, um, which makes very sobering reading. Um, so this is what we call the AIDS syndrome. We think it's not working. Um, here's a picture from, from Haiti. My colleagues and I then took a step back and said, but in the last three or four decades, a number of countries, regions, cities have transformed successfully. But they didn't do so because there were 10,000 projects from the UN agencies. 
or massive amounts of foreign aid. They followed their own path, and they in managed to pull themselves out of poverty and instability and corruption and sometimes war, and enter on this remarkable path to economic growth. Now, here's a picture of, um, on the left, Singapore in the 1960s, and then Singapore today. And Singapore probably stands as one of the best examples of transformation. Many people will say, though, it's just a city, or it was only good, so there's a scale question, or it was always going to succeed because of one reason or other. So we've looked at a, a range of other countries. Um, South Korea is another one. It's remarkable transformation between the 1960s um, and today. So just in a few short decades, has really tra transformed its economy and its society. But there are others as well. There are many success stories emerging in, in Africa today, as, as many of you will know, ranging from Rwanda, which we'll hear about, um, Mozambique, Ghana, a range of others. There have been transformations in the Middle East, um, UAE, Oman, and, and hopefully Tunisia and Egypt um, embarking on a new phase of, of transition or transformation. Successes in, in Latin America, and a number of successes in Eastern Europe. And although Europe looks a little bit shaky today, the enormous successes that the EU accession process has brought because countries had to follow a, a framework to, to meeting certain standards. Um, we looked at each of those successful transitions and thought about what was it that drove them, what, what enabled a country, what was behind the success story that went from poverty and corruption and instability to um, remarkable prosperity um, for its citizens. And at the top of these comes leadership and teamwork. And while history will often talk about one individual and usually a, a great, the great man theory, they say it was this person's charisma or their individual vision that made the success work. When we started interviewing the people who were involved, it turned out there was always a team, there were a team of seven to 10 people, but then there were leaders at different levels in different places and they worked together as a team. And they didn't have a cookie cutter plan. It wasn't a 15 year blueprint, but they had an idea of where they wanted to get to and they knew it was going to take at least 10 to 15 years, probably longer, and they committed for that duration. Then there was a lot of improvisation along the way. They committed to rule of law, not rule by law. They understood that they themselves were subject to the law, but they knew they had to build consensus on what the rules of the game, what the laws were going to be. They had an orientation to citizenship and then they put that goal of growing the economy, creating jobs and sustainable enterprises, and investing in vocational training right at the top. And when we contrast these steps to how the aid system works today, we see a huge gap between the two. For example, one of the rules of thumb that the aid system uses today is that countries must have all the kids in primary school. Nobody can argue with that. But what they're doing is persuading countries not to invest in vocational training and secondary education in many parts of the world. By contrast, these reformers said, we've got to start with vocational training. We've got to train the people of our country to be able to do the jobs that we need them to do. So third, going forward, what lessons can we learn and where are the opportunities for investors, for corporations, who, business people who want to get involved and the enormous talent and latent potential that exists in many countries. Um, they're called fragile states or failed states by many people. I've recently been chairing a group for Davos and we started off by renaming them and saying, can we find another term? Is it pre-emerging markets or is it frontier economies? Um, no consensus yet on the name, but I think we need to start looking at the opportunity and not only the negatives. So first recommendation, instead of looking at the needs and looking at the gaps, how do we turn that proposition upside down and, and make an asset map? What are the tremendous assets, tremendous opportunities that exist within the societies? There's the human capital. People may not have university degrees, but they have incredible talent, enthusiasm, hard work, energy, and capabilities. The natural capital. Of the 70 so-called poorest countries or fragile states, three quarters of them have significant natural wealth in oil, gas, or minerals, um, or like Nepal, in what, Nepal's white gold is its p potential hydropower. They've got enough potential hydropower to power northern India if they were to get their hydro um, sector organized. Um, social capital. Um, they may not have forms of governance that look like a Western democracy, but when one peels back the onion a little bit further, you see tremendous 
um, forms, especially at the local level, of consultative participatory democracy, decision making, and governance. Um, second, one to two billion people currently trapped in conflict and bad governance in many parts of the world are also potential consumers, entrepreneurs, and producers, and represent a huge market, as um, Prahalad and many others have pointed out. And in many societies, well, there's a tremendous amount of money and potential for investment even within the society. It's just not yet transformed into investable capital. So here, some illustrations. Um, agriculture in Africa, hydropower in Nepal, tourism in Haiti, and the incredible and growing urban markets in, in, in the urbanizing cities across the world, this picture from, from Latin America. So what, what needs to be done to, to realizing the potential? I think the bad news is that there's no formula. There's no, there's no cookie cutter approach. The good news is that there are many, many examples of success. And this is where we need innovation, new designs, um, not necessarily planning of tens of thousands of projects, but new designs of ways to link knowledge and know-how capital investments, corporate engagements, with the incredible latent and, and real capacity and talent that exists on the ground. Um, where are the priority sectors? I think mining, and, and we had the discussion this morning on mining. Um, mining is going to remain a huge driver of future prosperity if the governance can be got right in many, many societies. Um, infrastructure and construction, um, are going to remain a huge 10 or 20% of the GDP of, of countries. Transportation, consumer goods, agriculture, and finance. These seem to be the main sectors that emerge again and again as the top five or six, but there will be others in niche, niche products and markets as well. And I think the challenge is how to innovate, how to scale new approaches that foster value chains, that link the human and ca natural capital with financial capital and know how to reach market opportunities. So my colleagues and I are now working on a market building approach. Um, and we think there's an enormous value proposition. There's a value proposition from business people who are interested to get engaged in new markets. There's a first mover advantage. And there are vast and untapped mar markets, including in the everyday. There are billions of people who need waste management, health, education, housing, transportation, in many cases willing to pay for them. It's an investment in stability and prosperity. My experience of working in countries around the world and when I go and meet teenagers in the southern part of Afghanistan, in the borderlands in Pakistan, in, in parts of Somalia, I've never met a teenager who doesn't come up to me and say, where can I get a training? Where can I get a job? These people want in. They don't want out. Um, and I think it's all of our responsibility to find ways to reach out to them so we can make their, their, their hopes and dreams come true. Um, so. I'd like to put forward a call to action for business to invest in and imagine new value chains that go from market back to products, um, to invest in people, um, to challenge the UN's proposition that primary only matters, to find ways to provide people the skill sets they need to compete in today's globalizing economy, to find ways to understand, mitigate, and ensure against risk. Many of these parts of the world seem, from the safety of Washington DC or Chicago, to be very, very risky. But when one takes a second look or a closer look, actually many of those risks, are, they're perceived risks, they're not real risks. But even if they're real risks, we have ways to mitigate those risks through risk insurance and other, other kinds of products. How do we engage with governments and society to foster the necessary changes and put pressure on for changes in policy and better engagement of the World Bank, of USAID and others? Um, how can we make sure that economic investment does go by principles of fairness and inclusivity, whether it's at the national level or within the local community? And how can we make sure that there are the right accountability systems in place? so that the profits don't end up in Swiss bank accounts. And I think there's a huge agenda that needs to be taken forward. Transparency International does a great job. Others are doing a great job to make sure that the accountability standards are in place so that the business deals work for everybody. Um, I'll stop there and look forward to your comments and, and, and questions. Thank you. <laughs>